My name is Che Green. As Ken just said, I'm with an organization called Faunalytics. Very briefly, for about 15 years, we have served as the research arm of the animal protection movement. We've got a bit of company that have come in in recent years, which we're very grateful for. What we do is a few different things. We work directly with animal protection groups to help them measure their impact as well as see what if, how they can be more effective. We provide independent studies on topics that we think are particularly relevant or important to the animal protection movement. And then we also create independent resources for individual advocates to help them sort of get their brains around research and how to apply it to their advocacy. And 15 years ago when we started the organization, we had to make a very strong case for why the organization needed to exist or why we needed to conduct research as a movement. I'm pleased to say that we no longer need to make such a strong case, but let me touch on a couple of reasons why I think it's important that we use research. And the first thing is that if you look around you and the people in this room, think about animal advocacy, we're still a very small percentage of the overall population. So in for-profit terms, we might be considered the early adopters of animal advocacy in some, some extent. Or we're the low-hanging fruit. We're the folks that are relatively easy to convert, right? And so we can't assume that the people that we're trying to convert down the road are necessarily going to be like us. And so research, consumer research in particular, helps us get out of our own heads and into the heads of the people that we're trying to change. So it's a very important function of research. Another, and, and Harish alluded to this quite a bit, is to use research to measure our impact. And not just measure an impact of any given program, but across a range of programs so that we can pick and choose what's more effective. Harish just pointed out brilliantly, sort of, we're the small ki the, the little kids on the block. We are very resource-strapped movement, right? We're relatively new. We have few resources, both money and personnel, relative to the challenge that we're trying to face. And that, that just puts more onus on us to figure out what's working and to use our resources strategically and judiciously. And that's, again, where research plays an important role. So research is important, data is very important, and statistics are important. Harish really covered the farmed animal issue, so I'm gonna go through sort of the range of other issues and also talk farmed animal very briefly. I'll go quickly through this because then I want to talk about what are the implications of statistics and how do we use that in our advocacy. So let's start with companion animals. These are the ones that are generally most familiar to us. And they, what we have is um, about 300 million, in the United States we have about 300 million companion animals that live in households, so almost one per human. And that's sourced from the American Pet Products Association, the leading industry group that tracks that information. That's about 65% or two-thirds of U.S. households that have a companion animal. Somewhat surprisingly, the most common companion animal is fish or fishes. Now, there's about eight fish per fish-containing household, so it's partly a large concentration. But over 100 million fishes living as companion animals in U.S. households. 86 million cats. There's also an estimate of up to 70 million feral and free-roaming cats that are living out there as well. Now, those might be classified as wild animals and not companion animals, but if you counted some of them as companion animals, we might be approaching those fish numbers. And then on this slide, rounding it out with about 78 million dogs. The other animals, 14 million birds, 12 million small animals, which is rats, uh, hamsters, gerbils, what have you, 9 million reptiles, and 8 million horses. Now let's focus on the sheltering community very briefly, and this is information from the ASPCA, which tracks this information pretty closely, even though these are somewhat broad ranges still. About seven to eight million companion animals enter U.S. animal shelters every year, and of course our sheltering system is set up pretty much just for dogs and cats, so the vast majority of those are dogs and cats. Uh, two to three million of those animals are adopted each year, and unfortunately two to three million are still euthanized each year. Um, a fair number of animals also are also returned to their guardians, or RTO for return to owner in shelter parlance. But there's a huge disparity there. About 25%, 26% of dogs, so a fourth of dogs are returned to their guardians, but only 5% of cats ever make it back and are reunited with their people. Again, going through this quickly, turning to animals used in science, and we'll look at a couple different perspectives. The first one is dissection. There's an organization called the National Anti-Vivisection Society that tracks dissection, and they estimate that about 12 million animals are used in dissection every year by just high school students. And so there would be more animals, of course, used in pre-high school and post-high school, but 12 million, roughly half invertebrates and half vertebrates. And they conducted a survey, actually, with Faunalytics a couple of years ago and found that 84% of pre-college biology teachers actually use dissection in their courses. 
Now, for the other animals, there's sort of two stories we have to tell. This probably won't be a surprise to most of the people in this room, but there are certain species that are used in research that are covered under the Animal Welfare Act, and then there are other species that are not. And much to the delight of the pharmaceutical industry and researchers, the ones that are not covered are the ones that are, of course, used most frequently. But let's take first a look at the, those that are covered under the Animal Welfare Act, starting off with large numbers of guinea pigs and rabbits, but we also test on a fair number of dogs and cats and, of course, primates as well. Now, this adds up to a little over 750,000, which may not be you know, one of the largest numbers we're talking about today, but it's certainly meaningful to those animals. The good news here is that th that number is actually declining. So since about 1992, the number of animals covered under the Animal Welfare Act has actually declined by a fair bit. The bad news is that most of that has shifted to the animals that aren't covered under the Animal Welfare Act. And so we have no good idea of how many mice, rats, and birds are actually used in research because there's no oversight and there's no requirement to actually track that because those lives apparently do not matter very much. So what we have is a very broad range of 20 to 90 million, which is sort of compiled from the few major anti-vivisection organizations out there. And obviously, we, we, you know, it's a, it's a huge range, but what we can say is that when you add in the dissection numbers, you add in the Animal Welfare Act, Welfare Act covered animals, you get to about up to 100 million animals used in research just in the United States each year. Animals used for food, I can't do any better than Harish did, but let's just add a quick global perspective. This is a map based on data from the United Nations, and it shows land animals only slaughtered by country. And what we see is that there's high concentrations in either countries that are most populous, like China, or countries that are most consumerist, of course, like the United States. So when you add up all that data, what you get, an estimate again from the United Nations, is 68 billion land animals killed per year for food across the globe. And arguably, that's, that's a very conservative estimate because a lot of countries either underreport or don't report to the FAO data set. Now, again, Harish touched on this, so I'm reiterating that point. The story is somewhat dominated by fishes. One to three trillion fishes are killed, according to U the UK organization fishcount.org. And that's a fairly solid estimate, even though it's a very wide range. And so if we're looking at orders of magnitude, it's much, much more than the land animals that are killed. And that same dynamic, as Harish pointed out, exists in the United States as well. Wild animals. Now, wild animals, we have a couple of different perspectives because there's anthropogenic wild animal suffering, which is what humans cause, and then there's naturogenic wild animal suffering, which is increasingly becoming a topic of consideration among animal advocates. But let's start with the first one. So in terms of human-caused wild animal suffering, this is certainly not exhaustive, but we'll look at a couple of different issues. So the terms of numbers of fishers and hunters in the country is relatively solid data. This is from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which tracks this information every five years. The latest one's coming out later this year, so this is five-year-old data. But we have about 33 million fishers in the country. I wouldn't trust these numbers too much in terms of the animals killed, and I'll tell you why. So in the fishes is based on, there are a total of 550 million days spent fishing by fishers in this country, anglers in this country. And if only a fish was killed only every other day fishing, and I have no clue if that's anywhere near the actual answer, that would be 275 million fishes. So I'm guessing that that's also conservative. The number of 200 million animals killed by hunters comes from in defense of animals. It's, uh, they, what they did is they rolled up state wildlife reports and got 100, and then they multiplied that by a factor of two for animals that they felt like were underreported. I, I wouldn't trust either of these numbers too much. Not slamming IDA, I just couldn't find their methodology to really have a lot of confidence in it. But if we look at naturogenic wild animal suffering, there is a much bigger story here, and I, a resource that I suggest people check out is reducingsuffering.org, run by a person named Brian Tomasic, who's a leading voice, I think, in wild animal suffering. And so if we think about our sphere of consideration as animal advocates, you know, we obviously we care about farmed animals, we care about research animals, all of these, but do we extend that sphere of consideration to animals that are being hurt by other animals? animals that are suffering for wild or for natural purposes, not necessarily for human purposes. And if we do extend our circle to that extent, then what we've got is a tremendous number of animals that we need to then consider. And I won't run down a list, but again, the story is somewhat similar. It's dominated by fishes to a large extent. So we have 10 trillion fishes, which is more than four times the number, the, the other number combined. 
the numbers get really big, and actually let me add one quick thing to that, which is that Brian also looks, and this is where your brain might start to hurt, hurt at insects. And so if we have, if we take into account bugs, and there's no good reason necessarily that we shouldn't, because even if they suffer at a much lower capacity, their numbers suggest that their aggregate suffering is something we should consider. There are a billion, billion bugs on the planet, is the estimate. And that are, that's insects, spiders, worms, etc. And so again, if we broaden that sphere, we're talking about a really large number of animals, so much that we probably can't even get our brains around it. Which brings me to one of my final points, which is how do we use this information? How do we use statistical data in our advocacy for animals? And I would suggest that we have sort of a dichotomous approach in how we use it. Internally, we use these figures to guide our advocacy, to choose between causes. I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to become a negative utilitarian tomorrow, but we need to factor in the magnitude of suffering for each of these issues into our decisions. If not on an individual level, then absolutely at a movement-wide level. So internally, we we use these statistics to guide our decisions. Externally, not so much, right? Because when you use large numbers externally for advocacy purposes, unfortunately, it doesn't resonate with very many people. Let me give you a quick example. So there was a study conducted in 1992. And what they looked at was they had three groups of people, and they asked how much each group would pay to save a certain number of migratory birds. The first group looked, was asked how much they would pay for 2,000 birds. The second group asked 20,000 birds. And the third group was asked how much they would pay to save 200,000 birds. So a huge difference in the number of lives at stake. The difference that people would pay, $8. So that's scope insensitivity. And it's, it's essentially irrational behavior. And it, it drives economists crazy. But it's very common among people. And that's partly why we can't use numbers to great effect. At least the magnitude of animal suffering doesn't resonate with a whole lot of people. Not only does it not resonate with a lot of people, but it actually could be counterproductive. Now, this is a, a chart I recreated from Stefan Dickert and his team in 2012. And it's just a, you know, I wouldn't hold these numbers to, I wouldn't take them to, to too much heart or literally. But what we've got is a, f a phenomenon where the more people you include in your advocacy message, the less of an emotional response that you get. I consider myself a numbers guy, and this chart pains me, right? This is, uh, this is disheartening, because that we have, that's what we have is an issue in our animal protection movement. We're talking about numbers. And in my opinion, and I'm a privileged white male, but this is the greatest social justice issue of, of modern times. And it's largely because of these numbers. So we can't use those numbers, though, for our advocacy. And so what we do instead is we focus on stories of individual animals. And that is largely more effective than talking about numbers. Now, there are people who have higher numeracy, numerical literacy, higher capacity for quantitative thought. Certain audiences like that might be receptive to the use of statistics, but most are not. And most are going to resonate more with these individual stories. So if I leave you with one thing, it's that, again, statistics are incredibly important. Research and data are incredibly important. But we use those things differently, whether we're talking about internal focus or external focus. Internally, use them for cause prioritization and to select how you're going to spend your limited resources. Externally, use them only very selectively and instead focus on smaller numbers, even individual animals, to elicit that emotional response and hopefully move people a little bit closer toward animal liberation. Thank you.